Hello. This will first air on January the 6th, 2021 for our midweek service. We're glad that you have joined us for this time of reflection and Bible study and time of prayer. I'd like for us to begin with a time of prayer. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we are grateful that we can gather around your holy word and listen for your voice, for your spirit to speak through your inspired words. And we pray, O oh God, that as we do that even now, that you would be with us and bless us and allow the, the words that you have shared to speak to us exactly where we are right now. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles, let me invite you to open them to Ephesians, the fifth chapter. This is going to be kind of a two-parter. I'm going to be continuing our thoughts. In fact, I'm going to do something I don't think I've ever done. I'm actually going to stop at a semicolon because that's where the, uh, the scripture, verse 7, ends. is really in the middle of a thought. I'll recapture that when we gather on Sunday. And Sunday we're going to be talking about God being the God of light. And he is our God and he calls us to be light. And so if I had a title, I might call it, How Can We Become God's Light Bulb? <laughs> well, maybe I need to work on that. But that's what we're going to go with right now. How can I become a light for God? And I want to suggest that God gives us uh, at least three ideas in the midst of our text today to understand how we can do that. Uh, and so I'm going to read the first seven verses of Ephesians chapter five, and then we're going to break it down into three sections. And I'm going to give us three words all beginning with the letter P to help us know how we can become the light of God. I begin to read in verse one. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. What a wonderful image, beloved children. And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead, let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or one who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. And I pause right there at the end of verse seven. I want us to think for a moment of, of what Paul is trying to say. And he, he is kind of repetitive in the book of Ephesians. He's already talked about making sure our speech was, was godly. And that's really the call is to be a bulb for God, a light bulb for God. We've got to be godly. We've got to be reflecting what Christ is in our life to the world in which we live. So the first thing, the first word beginning with the letter P is pattern. We must pattern our life. See what it says in, in verse one. Therefore, be imitators of God and beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. To imitate Christ, to pattern our life after Christ is the goal of every believer. So each morning when we rise up, I wonder what are the concepts 
that will guide our day? What are the goals that will guide our day? What can we say, what, when we rise up in the morning, what can we say, if I do this, say this, accomplish this, then it will be a successful day. Because that, those are the things that we will then in our mind try to work out in our living. And so he's telling us, he's reminding us that God has given us a pattern. He's given us a wonderful path to follow, a, a blueprint to follow, a map to follow. He's given us the life and the teachings of Jesus Christ. We study in God's word our Savior's lifestyle. We understand how he met people. We know that, that he often afflicted the comfortable and comforted the afflicted. And we need to understand that if we get too comfortable in, in our own understanding that we may well miss God. And Jesus came to make sure that every day we rise up and call him blessed. Are we patterning our life after our Lord and Savior. Are we imitators of God? How do we know how to be an imitator of God? The person of Jesus Christ, where, where Jesus is the Son of God, God who put on flesh and came and dealt with us. The word Emmanuel, right? We're right on the, the, the exiting of Christmas season, and we use that word a lot during Christmas. Emmanuel, God with us. We need to understand that the call for us is to pattern our life after Christ. And, and that's going to tie into that precaution that, that we'll get to in just a third point. But before then, I want to talk about really the second point, a major point, and especially in America. Uh, I want to suggest to you that the greatest sin facing America is impurity. And so... The, the second P, the word beginning with the second P, is purity. Did you hear what he said in verse 3? But sexual immorality and all impurity and covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. As I go to Parkview sometimes, they all have TVs running. And, and I'll sit in there sometimes with some of those dear uh, elderly saints and be ch chatting with them. And, and, you know, I can remember a time when if you came to somebody's house, they'd cut the TV off. They just cut, it was just a polite thing to do. Cut the TV off. Boy, whatever happened to that? <laughs> we don't cut it off anymore, do we? We don't cut it off for anything. And they don't cut their TV off. And sometimes it's hard to talk to them because they've got it so loud. But I want to tell you, I've walked into those rooms and sat there with some, some of our, our elderly saints and seen what was going on the television, the, the immorality of daytime television, of, of the soap operas, if you will. And I just realized we have just inundated ourselves as a society, and we've decided that sexual immorality is no longer a problem. I want you to hear what God's Word says. And I want you to hear it clearly. I've said it before. I'll say it again. God designed sexual expression to be between a man and a woman, a husband and a wife in the confines of marriage. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's what he designed it. It is a part of intimacy to create family. And family is the keystone for spiritual development and, and for emotional security and for financial security. That's God's plan, that a man will leave his mom and dad and cling to his wife and they will spend their life becoming one and they will have sexual union, but they'll have emotional union. They'll, they, they'll create a family. They'll have children in the confines of that marriage. And in that reality, that's where the proper expression of sexuality is and everywhere else, everywhere else, it's wrong. It's wrong to entertain ourselves with sexually explicit movies or games or songs. It's wrong. And he says, listen, that will affect your relationship with God. You can't imitate Jesus Christ when your life is full of impurity. You simply can't do it. But it is a challenge. I understand it. Because every TV commercial 
it seems like every song, everything in the, in the larger culture wants us to pattern our life after that. And I want us to hear the first word I gave and what Paul calls us to do, but be imitators of God. Pattern your life after God. And to do so, you cannot do so with impurity. And although our culture has now said things that used to be wrong or right, God's word still says they're wrong. And I'm still going to depend on God's word. How about you? How about you? Today, we need to understand that the sexual immorality, the, the impurity of language, of, of even our joke telling. Uh, now, he doesn't mean you can't, you can't have a good time and, and rib someone in an appropriate way. But now the, the humor too often goes to dark places or to impure places. And he says of that, no, that's not okay. That's not okay. And I want us to understand that's not okay. That's not okay. Look at it like this. You only got so many words in your lifetime, okay? We don't know what that number is. Don't waste any of them doing things that are contrary to God. He says, instead of doing those things, let there be thanksgiving. Let there be edifying. Let our words be building up one another, encouraging one another. Let us do the things that will help one another rather than to hurt one another, or rather to, to lead our minds to go to places that if we keep letting our mind go to impure places before long, we'll have an impure lifestyle ourselves. It's an important reality, especially in a culture like ours, where immorality and impurity are the main selling point for, for businesses and entertaining We've got to make sure we're different. That's what Paul is calling us to do. And then the last idea is a precaution. The last word beginning with a P is a precaution. He says, let no one deceive you with empty words. Oh my goodness, I get so frustrated in these day and times. It seems like for every one statement, there is a counter statement in our culture. Whether it be on social media or whether it be you watch this you watch this network versus this network. And so for everything, there seems to be empty words. And our question is, who has the empty words? Who's telling the truth? Listen, we, we talk now that there's two truths. No, 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 there's not two truths. There's one truth. And somebody's lying. And somebody's deceiving. And someone is leading us astray. And it just depends on who we choose to listen to. And I want to tell you, in a lot of things in our culture today, it's difficult. With the political polarization, for everything political, there are two sides. And they say the other side is dead wrong and we are exactly right. It can't be. It just can't be. It, it seems that, that even in dealing with, with the coronavirus, there have become two different dialogues. One diametrically opposing the other. They both can't be right. They both can't be right. How do we know which one is right? Oh, there's always a danger of being deceived. And he tells us in spiritual matters, you can be deceived. You can be deceived into to thinking that because you do this, that, or the other, you're okay. And yet you may be neglecting the more important weightier matters that we need to do. And remember when God said that, when he was talking about the Pharisees who tithed on the little things, they did all these traditional things that they thought were just right. But he said, you've neglected the important thing about relationship with people, about loving the people. You've used your, your religious structure in, in the Pharisaic world to beat up people. You can't do that. You've got to bring people where they are up. You've got to, to edify. We need to love everybody, regardless of their political opinion, regardless of, of even their, their morality. We're to love the immoral, but we're not to be immoral. We're to love the immoral, but we're not to be the immoral. We, we, we don't judge anyone and say, oh, you've got to do all this before you can come to Christ. You can come to Christ just as you are. But once you come to Christ, once you come into the saving power and the Holy Spirit dwells within you, the Holy Spirit 
will change you and make you something new. Don't be deceived into thinking that you can just come. I love that old statement. Just because you sit in a garage doesn't make you a Ferrari. And that's true. Just coming to sit in church doesn't make you a believer. You've got to make sure you've got a personal, life-changing, daily patterning your life after Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you're to be a believer in Jesus Christ, it's got to be the main thing in all that you do. Do not be deceived with empty words. He's given us a precaution. He's warning us. He says, for these things will bring the wrath of God. The sons of disobedience. Now in Ephesians 2, 2, he talks about the sons of disobedience. And he's using it there in chapter 2, verse 2, as those that were pagan, those that were totally outside the faith. But this, many scholars believe, is an indication of folks deceiving within the church. People who are in the church, but they have a semblance of godliness, but they don't have a relationship with God. He, they haven't patterned their life. And you can tell it. Oh, they, they may have positions in church office. They, they, may, they, they may be a pastor. They, they may be anything in the church. But if they haven't patterned their life after Jesus Christ, people see right through that. People know. People can see. Pe God gives us all a spiritual antenna. And we know when we encounter a true believer. We may disagree with him. There are people who hate true believers who are, the, the, the power of the devil is so powerful in their life, they can't stand to be in the presence of, of, of a godly person. But they know that's a godly person. <laughs> they know that's a godly person. We've got to make sure. So I ask us this question, taking all of this together, who, who are we patterning our life after? What are we patterning our life after? Because there's a, there's a precaution here. Don't pattern your life of success after any model, any model, except Jesus Christ is your Lord. Be an imitator of God, he says. Don't be an imitator of Gary McCullough. Don't be an imitator of a past pastor or a past deacon or a past Sunday school leader. Don't pattern your life after a, a, a wonderful person in the community or, or some one on television that you we use that word idolize. Isn't that a terrible word for a Christian to use? Idolize. He says, don't pattern your life after that. Because if you do, you're going to bring the wrath of God. He gives us his strong warning. He says, don't be partners with them. Don't associate with them. Does that mean we can't say anything to them? No, we've got to say things to them. But we can't allow that. Here's my biggest fear is that too often, we who are believers allow the world to influence us more than we influence the world. And we associate ourselves and we pattern our life the wrong way. If we're to be light bulbs, we've got to follow the pattern of God's light bulb. <laughs> we, we've got to be made in his design. We've got to be made in his design. We've got to make sure we're pure. We've got to make sure we're pure. We can't, we can't play around the edges of immorality or impurity or, or social things that we know aren't right. We can't do it. We've got to make sure we stay connected to God Almighty. We've got to make sure we're imitating Him in our rising up and in our going out and in our returning to home and our lying down at the end of the day. Loving the Lord with all our heart, mind, and soul. Oh, that's what we've got to do. When we do that, when we heed his precaution not to pattern ourselves after an impure world, then we can become the light that can show others the love of Christ that can change everything. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. Would you take these words, these reflections, these thoughts on your word and use them for your glory. Challenge us where we need to be challenged. Encourage us where we need to be encouraged. Chastise us where we need to be chastised. That we might indeed be imitators of you. Patterning our life in purity. And not falling into other patterns besides you. For our prayer 
is in Jesus' holy name. Amen.